Welcome to our fourth Tuesday of Ask an Expert. We're going to continue with Susan Etchett tonight, but I'm also very excited to introduce one of her colleagues. Dr. Hanley is here also with her tonight, and we'll be sharing their expertise together. Dr. Hanley has done a lot of research and has continued and will continue in studying ways in which schools and communities can support the success of culturally and linguistically diverse females with or at risk of emotional and behavior disorders. So thank you, Dr. Hanley, for joining tonight. And hopefully all her students made it. So not that she's counting, but hopefully they're all <laughs> there too. That being said, I'm going to turn it over to Whitney and Susan. And thank you so much for both being here tonight. Well, welcome everyone. And as you can see, Whitney has joined me this evening and I am delighted that she's here. And so we'll just kind of split our presentation tonight. And then as Deb indicated, we'll all take any questions that you have at the end of that. Again, we're delighted to be here and, and very happy to have this opportunity to, to share this information with you. So as you know, the focus of tonight's session is on behavior intervention plans and the connection to mental health supports. Just a couple of introductory comments before I share a little bit as I did last week of the case law with you. Again, we've got an awful lot of research that's highlighting some of the negative outcomes that are associated with mental or behavior health problems. And the second bullet suggesting that it's these prevention-based frameworks that have been very successful in both prevention and intervention in our school settings. Those behavioral supports do include the use of behavior intervention plans, which again, there are pretty significant positive outcomes that have been demonstrated when BIPs are implemented. How do behavior intervention plans support student mental health? Well, we're going to propose to you that they are a vital component of what we continue to talk about with this group, uh, first Nikki and, and then me and now Whitney, and that's school-based mental health services. So I'd again highlight that the BIPs are developed collaboratively by the entire IEP team, which I'm hoping resonates with you in that it assures a connectedness with families in communication, goal coordination, joint decision making. And also importantly, BIPs, just like our IEPs, are individualized to meet the student's unique mental, emotional, behavioral, and social needs. So it's that individualization, the family connectedness that make these particularly effective support strategies. So here's the questions we're hoping to address tonight. First, just how does the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, our IDEA statute, address a student's mental, emotional, behavioral, and social needs? What are the components of a BIP that, again, has been developed to address those needs? My piece will be what case law examples illustrate how these components do address the student's needs. And then Whitney will talk about the prevention and interventions needs that address behavioral challenges. So just a very little bit on the statute itself, but I kind of wanted to show you the anchor here. In, in the IDEA is a very clear support for these behavioral plans. The first one just says we can use even 15% of the funding coming into schools for early supports, both academic and behavioral. I think you're aware of this. This is very explicitly required, and that's that the IE team address behavior when it's impeding a child's learning or that of others, and to consider the use of positive behavioral interventions and support. So this is federal and state law to address the behavior needs. Maybe something that you weren't as aware of, but 
I need to highlight, and that's the general education teacher's role or the regular education teacher's role. So again, it's a shared responsibility to develop these positive behavior interventions and supports. And then there's a whole bunch way beyond our conversation tonight that is included in the discipline provisions regarding these behavioral supports. And there's a little more discipline. And then this was an article that I had authored quite a, a ways back, as you can see. And then this is the one that Whitney and I are collaborating on, kind of an update of this, this article, where we're taking a look at the case law and the behavior intervention plans and taking a look at some themes. And that's what I'll begin to share with you this evening. So the first theme that was identified in my analysis was that the BIPs have to be developed when behaviors are interfering with student learning. So this is what I call my handwriting is on the wall slide. If you're looking at a behavior that's interfering with the student's learning or the learning of others, then we have to step up to the plate and develop these plans. Let's take a look at just a couple cases here. I know I mentioned to you guys last week, I kind of live in this world of acronyms, so please don't hesitate to uh, chat in questions if, if I'm not clear in terms of what those are representing. So uh, as you remember up at the top, anytime we see that SEA acronym, we know that that's a due process hearing. And we'll look at a couple that have DC or district court decisions. And we're gonna take a look at a few from the eighth circuit because we're in the eighth and that law is controlling. So this is an 11 year old who's escalating behavior resulted in a physical attack on the paraprofessionals. And the school district's arguing the program was appropriate, but this is held for the parent. And you can see the very clear conclusion, the omission of the FBA and the BIP deprived the student of educational benefit. And then look what was ordered. The school district had to hire a certified behavior analyst engaged on the district's dime to evaluate and develop the IEP and the BIP. So I'd highlight in that last statement there, it really isn't a, a matter of the school district not having people with this expertise, but rather what I call, you don't get a second bite of the, at the apple. You saw this happening, it was escalating, it wasn't a single occurrence, and again, should have developed that plan. Here's another one from a district court decision, an elementary student with emotional and behavioral disorders and ADHD. The parent, again, arguing the school district failed to complete that FBA BIP. Here, the school argued that an informal behavior plan was integrated and acceptable. Uh, no, and this is gonna be held for the parent as well. Since the behaviors were the sole focus of the IEP, the functional behavioral assessment and the subsequent behavior plan must be conducted. Okay, so again, on kind of the student's needs. Here's another decision, a 10th grade student with learning disabilities, later changed to other health impairments. And that's where a lot of the children with attentional needs uh, access services. But here the parents saying the school district had failed to develop these behavioral supports for three years. And what had happened is the school district social worker had developed a responsibility contract. Well, again, as you can see, this one's held for the parent. This responsibility contract was no substitute for a behavior intervention plan. And since the parents had been very concerned, they removed their child from school and put the student in a private school. And so tuition reimbursement for that school and the transportation costs were awarded. A couple of kind of more recent cases that we've added for you tonight. This is a five-year-old student with autism. And the parent is saying the student is unable to access the curriculum due to self-stimulatory behavior, inappropriate vocalizations, and inattention. This is a very surprising response from the school district, and that is that these behaviors are not unusual for a student with autism. This one's going to be held for the parent. The failed, uh, failure to include a BIP was going to cost them in terms of reimbursement. 
Susan, like I'm going to interject just a minute. Somebody asked the s and I'm assuming that means student to parent, correct? Is that what the oh, S? Oh, yes. Uh huh. Thank you. Thank you. P is for parent and S is for student. I, gotcha. This is great. Yes, I, I need this because, like I say, I kind of swim in these acronyms. But, but I like this last line. It just says, the inquiry is not if the behavior is atypical, but if the behavior impedes learning. So that was very much justified in terms of an outcome for the parent. And please keep your, your questions or asking for uh, clarification coming. Thank you. The other side is student with ADHD. And here the parents saying that the school district failed for over a two year period to conduct that behavior analysis and the BIP, despite severe elopement, student was leaving the uh, classroom and the campus often. And the behavior deteriorated, as you can see. And so this is also going to be held for the parent and awarded 180 hours of compensatory education. And that comp ed as a remedy suggests that the school district did not provide what it was supposed to provide and therefore additional hours would have to be made up. So that was the first theme. It was kind of the handwriting on the wall. If behaviors are interfering, step up to the plate and again, develop that behavior intervention plan. The second theme says the plan that you're developing needs to be based on assessment data. And we describe those as we have been, and that's a functional behavioral assessment. Let's take a look at just a couple cases here. This is, again, a high school student with specific learning disabilities. Here, the parent is challenging the appropriateness and the sufficiency of the evaluations. School district described very appropriate and extensive efforts. This one's kind of interesting because this one was held for the school district, but the behavior plan was, again, appropriately conducted and interpreted. But again, there was a lack of cooperation that was the reason for the difficulties. In this next case, a 13-year-old student with learning disability, we've got the parent arguing that the school district failed to provide an appropriate FBA and to implement or modify the behavior plan to meet the student's needs. The school district's arguing that they're both just fine. This one's going to be held for the parent. It, it had multiple issues. We're just sharing those that are very specifically focused on our topic tonight. So the school district was ordered to provide a more detailed FBA and to address the behavior function. They took a very dim view of what they described as a cursory functional behavioral assessment and the use of home timeouts. I, I highlight that because I've read a zillion behavior intervention plan, well, maybe not a zillion, but quite a few. And I'm always amazed at some of how these interventions are described like home timeout. I looked at another one that was an OTO, which represented an overnight timeout. I hope you see where this is, is going. You can call these anything you want, but if, if this is a suspension, then you're very limited in the use of these. And that's just 10 days for the year. Another one 13 year old student with emotional disturbance, ADHD, and the parents alleging that the BIP with a shortened school day, parent escort, adult supervision, denied the student FAPE. School districts arguing that its BIP was appropriate. And here again, held for the parent, the BIP was outdated, inappropriate. The school district was ordered to conduct extensive psychoeducational neuropsychological evaluation. I also highlight that word, those words, short and school day, to suggest to you that one thing that we're kind of watchful in, in terms of interventions and supports is that as behavior intensifies, we hope that the first response is not less, less of a school day, less of a school week. Again, there are some children who do require those shortened and abbreviated time periods. But we would also hope that a variety of other responses to challenging behavior would be explored. A couple of other ones, six-year-old student with autism, 
the parents alleging that, that the proposed restrictive placement that the school district was interested in was inappropriate. And the school district said, well, they didn't do an FBA, but they based this plan on reports. And they said it does include target behaviors and strategies, but this one is held for the parents. The failure to do the FBA uh, led to an inappropriate behavior plan. I like these next descriptions. The plan was vague and didn't match behaviors with specific interventions and strategies. If I could highlight one thing tonight, it would be that we are clearly moving towards a specification of strategies on the IEP and the BIP. We've, we've kind of steered away from that for the longest time, worried, I think, that that in some way was you know, tying the hands of teachers in terms of exploring alternatives, but I don't know how we determine if a plan is working and how we adjust that plan unless we know what those strategies were. The one across, a student with ADHD and ODD hyperactivity aggression, inappropriate peer and adult interactions, and the school district's response to the parent's due process appeal was that the behavior incidents had decreased by a certain percentage you see represented from 84 to 76. Then again, hell for the parent. The BIP that included breaks and kind of the Dean of Student Intervention, not based on data. Our third theme is that just like an IEP, the BIP must be individualized. Here we look at a case of a student with emotional disturbance and attention deficit. And the parent is charging that the program did not include individualized supports. The school district countered, well, we are offering group counseling. No, this one's held for the parent. The school district's offering of group counseling did not equate with the specific and individualized interventions that the student needed. Our fourth theme, BIPs must include positive behavioral supports. So what that will eliminate would be suspensions, any sort of timeout. And I have, I've tried to advocate very forcefully that if you are using any sort of seclusion or restraint as a intervention, that those have no place on either an IEP or a BIP. These are not educational interventions. They may be emergency interventions, safety interventions, but not the positive supports that are to appear on our plans. So again, this one, deficiencies of the BIP denied FAPE for a high school student with learning disabilities and ADHD. Rather than counseling or social skills, uh, the BIP just said what the student should not do, refrain from name calling, avoid contact with students. So again, without specifying those alternative appropriate behaviors, the BIP was insufficient. A couple of other ones, this one's out of the Eighth Circuit, so we have to pay attention to this one. A 12-year-old student with autism, Asperger's, um, school districts appealing uh, a decision that they failed to provide the student with FAPE. But this one is, that's why it's in red again, and no cohesive plans. There were only goals and objectives and not specific strategies. Same thing, look just across the page, 16-year-old student with autism. Again, parent not involved in the VIP development. And again, uh, claiming the BIP inappropriate, held for the parent. Look at that. It didn't include replacement behaviors or systems to reinforce the appropriate behavior. Staff training and a new BIP order. Another high school student with autism and anxiety, annual behavioral goals. Again, just take a look at those red words again. The goals are reasonable, but the services and supports provided to achieve those goals were unreasonably lacking. And finally, BIPs must be implemented as planned and monitored, just as IEPs must be. Here we have a 10-year-old student and the parents alleging that the school district failed to provide the services to address those behavioral needs. And this is held for the parent because again, the failure to implement that BIP resulted in a crisis for the student. 
You can see what the remedies were, ordered to hire specialists and train staff. A couple of other more recent cases, another student with multiple disabilities. School districts conducting the FBA and the BIP, but the behaviors continue to impede learning. This is the second, I think, most important highlight I'd like to share with you. And that is, as the behaviors are not improving, that IEP team must reconvene and make changes to the BIP, just like they would to an IEP. Across a 10-year-old student with intellectual disabilities and disruptive behaviors, exceeding 50, excuse me, 55 times per day. School districts saying, yeah, well, I, uh, we've got all this and this is on the plan and this is on the plan. And yet they failed to implement any of those interventions on the plan. And then again, another case where the school district offered these support services as needed Okay, and again, that ambiguity is going to cause an implementation failure. And it's the responsibility of the teacher of record to inform the teachers regarding those supports. A link to the behavior intervention plan developed by the Iowa DE. Uh, you may have seen this before, but it's a nice resource for us. So I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing for just a second here and see if before I turn things over to Whitney, if there are any questions that you would like for me to address right now. Susan, we had just a couple real quick. What classifies if a student needs a BIP or not? How do you go about getting them for a student? Okay, great question. And as that first theme suggested, if you're looking at a behavior that's impeding the learning of that child, or other children, the law requires the IEP team to address and plan positive behavioral supports. So if again, you are concerned about the social, the emotional, the behavioral needs of the child, then again, you should very directly ask the school to conduct a functional behavioral assessment and develop a behavior intervention plan. Now, I tell all my prospective administrators in law class, once you're in receipt of a parent request for this assessment and plan, they have only two choices. They either get one going, get your con consent and move forward, or they provide prior notice and clearly explain why they are not going to move in that direction. Can you step back to the law and discipline when a BIP is not followed? And then the other one was how often should a FBA be done? Oh, she said to discipline of the student. Okay, and uh, let me just try, and if I've misinterpreted, let me know. If the question is, can we rely on these legal foundations to request these supports? If, if I'm understanding, the answer to that is absolutely, absolutely. And the uh, FBA is kind of similar to the assessment data that goes into an IEP. So we would do an annual review and make a determination if more data are needed. And then just as we would on the IEP, as I think the last few slides suggested, there is a requirement that the IEP teams reconvene if, again, we're looking at a failure to achieve those goals or a lack of students' progress. That was the best thing that the Andrew case gave us that the Supreme Court handed down in 2017. And it said, you'll know you're looking at a free and appropriate public education if the student has an IEP that's reasonably calculated to result in progress. We finally got that word progress from the Supreme Court, and then we're able to move forward with our request. Let me go ahead and turn things over to Whitney. Before I talk about one of the specific intervention and also prevention strategies that I have implemented and used with students, I wanna talk about and highlight in some of the challenges that we do have in schools when we are excluding students and is specifically using exclusionary discipline with students that have behavior challenges. So when students aren't in the classroom, they're losing that instructional time. And so we have that loss of instructional days, which when they're not in the classroom or not in the school space, they're also 
having a reduced academic su supervision and support, less engagement when they come back into the school space and integrating back into the classroom with, with their peers. And then students receive labels and stigmas that are attached to them when they're repetitively excluded or, or disciplined in punitive ways in, in the school space. So in order to support students, as we know best, and students that have behavior intervention plans and students that are struggling in terms of their behaviors and need those supports in place for them. And one of the first things that we have to do in approaching these prevention and intervention strategies is being transformative in our practices. And what I mean by that is as teacher preparators, as prepares for future teacher educate teachers and as as in our practice we we need to be critically conscious and critically reflective of the things that we do so that requires collaboration of all stakeholders that includes our students that includes parents that includes administrators and everyone in the school building and really evaluating how we are responding to behaviors how our own personal biases can create a lens for how we are responding to behaviors because we cannot separate the person from the professional. And because those two things are integrated when we're in the school space, it's important for us to be culturally responsive and continuously monitoring the practices that we're using in, in the school. Next slide. So one of the things that I will highlight in this intervention is the importance of student voice and how we have to empower our students in owning and being self-aware, but then also owning these individualized plans and feeling like they're, they are um, part of the plan. It's not something we're doing to them or creating for them, but we're creating with them, students and, and families. So what you see here is some results of a um, qualitative study that I conducted for my dissertation in which I interviewed girls, Black girls with disabilities who have had multiple experiences with discipline. And in those interviews, I asked the girls about their relationships with teachers, their relationships with peers, administrators, and their experiences and interactions with these individuals when they were being planned. And this first slide and then the next slide that we will go to shows some themes. And what you will notice between these two slides, what comes up within these conversations are relationships and that mutual, that need for mutual respect and trust between themselves and, and adults. And the challenge in the classroom with power dynamics, the role of the teacher versus the role of the student and how that interplays in our interactions and our responses to behaviors. The next slide. So again, relationships came up in, in the conversations with the girls. Awareness, their awareness, but then also awareness of their teachers and other administrators in the building and how particular adults they could count on as advocates for them in, in situations and in interactions where they were being disciplined. And I emphasize that word empathy and student voice, and it really will inform this intervention that I'm about to share with you here within the next few slides. Next slide. So one of the intervention and the preventative strategies that I was part of and used in a, and this was an elementary school, we called the break room. And I collaborated with Dr. Rebecca Hines in Orlando in University of Central Florida. And this space was created in the school to help reduce the time out of class, the students were sp spending out of the classroom. They were being sent out of the classroom due to various 
behaviors. And the, the issue was, is that you would find students either setting to wait to see the principal or sitting in the front office or being in the in-school suspension room and spending their entire days not in an instructional environment. So this intervention, the break room, was created to create, to give students a temporary break to help them to de-escalate from whatever behavior that was occurring at the time, but not only giving them that temporary break, but while they're in that space, giving them those skills and those tools to help themselves to de-escalate and modeling for them. When I'm upset, this is what I can, this is what I do. Now, empowering them to choose ways that they could de-escalate on their own. And next slide. I'm kind of getting ahead of myself here. <laughs> so once students enter this space, what was important is that we had a protocol. And this protocol we shared not only with our undergraduate students that helped to facilitate this space, but we shared with every adult in the building so that they have familiarized themselves. And this was important in fidel implementation fidelity, because again, as we talk about how you can't separate the personal from the professional, making sure that we were all consistent with students and on the same page. When you enter this space, it's a welcoming, warm space. We created it to replicate like a, a home cozy space. We had a couch, we had a reading corner, we had some sensory items in the, in the room. We had like soft music playing, dim the lights, to, so that immediately when students stepped into that space, they were in an environment that, that helped to calm whatever behavior was occurring at the time. And then they followed this protocol, as you will see with this protocol here, there is a response that can be given that we used in response to how the students would respond to the directive that was given when they entered the, the room. I don't know if I, I mentioned this before, but the students, when they entered the space, it was 15 minutes. So we was, they come into the room, we set the timer, again, emphasizing a temporary break for 15 minutes, and then we would explain to them when the timer goes off, we'll transition back into the classroom and we will walk, take the student back to their, their classroom. This slide here will, it just shows you some of the things that we, data that we collected when the students entered. And that was helping not only inform us, but administrators and teachers in the building, what students and what grade levels were using the space the gender of the students that entered the space, their reason for their visit. So we expanded over time. This was not, not just a space, a temporary space for behavior supports, but we also allowed teachers to utilize, utilize the space for students who needed additional academic supports or any kind of extension activity. So they, we would indicate that in their visit. And then we rated the student's demeanor when they entered the room. So on a scale of one to five, with one being calm and five being extremely aggressive or agitated. And then again, rated the student's demeanor when they exited the space. So again, one being calm and five being extremely aggressive or agitated. As I stated before, we wanted to make the space cozy. So we also track the areas of the, the room that students chose to calm down or de-escalate. So we had like a picnic table area, a study table. There was a tent in the room. There's a space for students to engage in art projects. That we had the couch and we also had a reading corner. And then we indicated whether or not the student exited within the first prompt after the timer, 15 minutes was up and then overall we tracked how effective our performance was with the students in implementing that protocol with fidelity next slide so what you will see here are our break room passes and the reason that we implemented these are were twofold one because we wanted to 
provide a way for students, you know, when they're transitioning from their room into the break room space so that teachers and other adults in the building would know, you know, where they're headed. But then also so that students, to empower students to initiate when they needed breaks themselves. So what we did was we gave each teacher a set of these break room cards so that when students, they could request a break. And at the beginning, when we first implemented this intervention, teachers would send students to the space. By the end of that semester, when we implemented this intervention, students were requesting the break because it became part of the culture of the school. Next slide. And then this last slide here are highlight some, some trends that we saw from the data and students have chose over, overwhelmingly the cozy corner that had the overstuffed chair and had different toys. And there were 61% of, of visitors that selected that area. And again, this was in uh, implemented in the elementary school. The other four areas were equally used. Two thirds of the visitors to the break room were boys. 42% of the visitors were rated as calm when entering and 15% were rated as aggressive or agitated. 86% of the visitors were rated as calm when they left the room and only 1% rated as aggressive or agitated when leaving the break room. And we try to be very intentional about, again, those conversations that we have with the student, teaching them and giving them those skills of regulating their emotions and de-escalating. And 97% of the time, students smoothly transitioned out of the break room when the timer sounded. So that was all I had for you all. Is any questions or comments on that? Uh, Whitney, I do have one. It says, regarding the break room, how did you address students whose behavior function is escape? Were they limited to a number of visits? No, we, we didn't limit the number of visits and that was just because of the temporary, the 15 minutes. So we stuck to that time. However, we didn't have any students in this implementation that were repetitively using it so much that it became an issue. I hope that addressed. Yeah, I think so. So question. basically kids were not abusing it to get out mm -hmm. of work. They were actually using it to calm and to recalibrate so they could go back to class and continue learning. Yes, and the ideal of the space as well, it was eventually, well, two things. Uh, well, I guess in my mind, <laughs> I could see this space as being, you know, the administrator or, you know, the principal, that's their office, right? Instead of having the space where we're sending students to the front office and also eventually having a space for that, like, this for teachers in, in their classrooms. So we tried to model it and we implemented it school-wide first, but of course the, the goal would be to pare it down to having a space for that like that for students within their classroom. Yeah, thanks Whitney. One thing I was gonna highlight before we take your questions, I hope the difference between Whitney's break room and timeout and seclusion are mm -hmm. so evident. You're looking at the difference between a very positive behavioral support for students, one that really increases and encourages student initiation. As Whitney said, you know, they're asking for that. So there's more self-regulation there, as opposed to timeout and seclusion, which again are going to be imposed upon students. So Whitney provided this presentation to us the very first time we were introduced to her. And we were so very impressed with not only the, the research itself, but just her obvious dedication to, to, to kids and to provide them with these sorts of supports. So. Well, and Susan, I'm going to piggyback up um, what you said. And Angelisa, I know you're on tonight, so you'll, I won't put you on the spot. But when we think about PBIS and that all kids, that we want 
It shouldn't be just IEP focused, right? That's what we started with tonight, but this can support all kids. So if a kiddo needs a break room, it can be built into their BIP or their plan, but they don't have to, I mean, other kids could also access that, that break concept. So that's where I went with my thinking that this fits in that all inside of that PBIS. This could be a tier one, right? That this could meet the needs for lots of kids, not just identified kids. So I wanted to throw that out there. So thank you, Whitney. We do have a few questions. And Whitney, this is for you, Saf. Was it expected that students would initiate their break or were they ever prompted to go to the break room? In the beginning, they were prompted. And what we, we tried to, to be very intentional and had at the beginning, before we implemented the break room, met with all the teachers and administrators in the building to talk about you know, the, the theory behind the practice so that everyone was clear in the use of the break room. And initially it was teacher initiated when students would use the space. So another question, Whitney, where can one find more information about helping teachers develop the break room or a break corner in their classroom? Do they email you? What, what would you suggest? Yes, you can, you can email me and I would love to help support that. Okay, Definitely. so I, I think, of course, I, do you want to just put your email maybe in oh, the chat sure. or Susan, okay. if you want to stick it there? So anyways, be careful because we're all going to reach out to you now. I liked what Whitney said too. I, you know, we're, we're, we're finally realizing that this is part of establishing a culture in a school that's very student centered and supported. And I heard Whitney reference that several times. I mean, these have to become very common sorts of locations, if you will, in school so that we don't end up reverting to more restrictive and punitive sorts of responses to challenging behaviors. So. Exactly. So Susan, this is probably something that you maybe can speak to. Will there be new guidelines around safety plans, which include seclusion and restraint, not included in the bed since safety plan is currently a category within the web system? Yeah. And I, if Whitney knows this too, she's very much into the very professional and personal advocacy. I showed up at all the hearings on Chapter 103. I provide written uh, statements and documents. Our department developed this. So I am extremely hopeful that we will begin to make these distinctions and that we're not, again, forced into the web nature of development to fail to distinguish this within plans for, for students. The other piece, and I know we can certainly talk a little bit more about chapter 103 if, if of interest, but one of the best parts in my view is the new debriefing requirements that are in the seclusion and restraint law. And it requires that after the use of either of those restrictive or an intrusive interventions that again, the team meets, including parents to discuss a variety of things triggers, alternatives, and responses during and after. But one thing that we were advocating, and that is that part of that debrief be kind of a, an abbreviated FBA. Someone mentioned the word escape and what do we do, you know, there. But mostly we were, you know, trying to propose that we now move and incorporate social emotional learning as part of the SDI students will get. So this becomes as important as the academic. And again, I, I, I'm sure we're all on the same page there, but you know, what we were able to do is provide very specific examples of what the SDI would look like for students with, again, social emotional needs. And again, that those should be incorporated into those plans. So uh, this has been, it's very exciting work and yet, I think I might have mentioned this last week. It just seems like we're taking baby steps and we can't quite get there fast enough. And so, again, this is a, the importance of very broad based advocacy. So, Susan, I want to just piggyback. Actually, ASK is holding their annual conference over four Saturdays. Together we can, you can sign up on the website. And on May 15th, we have Len Sandler and Nathan Kirsten, and they were a part of the development. Len is with, he's a professor at University of Northern of Iowa, and Nathan is part of uh, DRI, Disability Rights Iowa, and they were very much a part of the, as Susan talked about, there were a lot of players at the table, and I believe that they were 
part of that journey also. So if you want to hear more about chapter 103, I'd encourage you to sign up for, for the Together We Can and at least join the May 15th. I also want to give a plug for, as we continue this work around mental health, we wanted to go and just continue to ask folks out there, what, what else can we share with families? So we have May 4th, again, it's on our website, and it's what's new with the children's behavioral health service system. And so we're going to hear from Darcy, CEO at Heart of Iowa Community Service, May from Mental Health and Disability Services of the East Central Region, and Julie from Community Health Systems for the Iowa Department of Human Services. So those might be ones that you want to join us. And then we also have one on May 11th, a mental health crisis can occur at any time. She is also going to share some things about, uh, I think, through NAMI to, to just ways and strategies. So as we continue to explore this and work together with families and professionals, it takes all of us together. So I just wanted to put that plug in there for the, for the 103 coming up. So and Anastasia, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I just read your chat. She says, we had, you probably are seeing, we had our first brief last week. And again, it is the first and then after recurrence, which needs a little work, but how, how did it go? Did it, did it help to inform changes in the behavior plan, Anastasia? And you don't have to answer if you don't want to, but I'm, I'm always interested in how these are looking, if you will, on the ground. So hopeful that these aren't just perfunctory, you know, well, it said we had to debrief and we did, but they really were helpful in terms of informing those, the subsequent behavior plans and revisions. So just my own curiosity. Yeah. So they held a meeting the day after the incident and they were just documenting and asking questions about exactly what happened, who was present. And then they kind of talked about whether the behavior plan was sufficient or whether it needed to be improved. And they concluded that had the behavior plan been followed, the outcome would have likely been different. And then that was the extent of it. They did talk about potentially gathering some additional data if it occurred again. Yes, perfect. And again, thank you, Anastasia, so much, because the failure to follow the agreed upon plan resulted in an escalation of behavior that eventually resulted in the, the use of these restrictive practices. So again, good, that's to be the purpose. It just said, what happened here? What are we going to do to change or modify? So we really do appreciate you. I will add, he still ended up with the suspension after the meeting, but. Thank you. Thank you. So we have Anna, I have, she says two questions. Could something like a break room be an inappropriate support in a BIP or would it be considered like a timeout? I really like the idea of a break room. And I think it would be so, help so many students. However, I worry about how it might be perceived by colleagues. And then her second question, how did other teachers in the school respond to the break room? Thanks, Hannah. Whitney, I think I'm gonna turn that over to you. Sure. Yeah, thank you, Hannah, for your question. Hannah is one of my students. <laughs> so um, the first question you asked was, could the break room be perceived as a timeout? What sets the break room apart from a timeout is that when students are in the space, we are addressing those social, social and emotional needs. So we're giving them the tools and the skills to regulate their emotions and to de-escalate from behaviors versus a timeout that is removing a student from the space but has no intentions of giving them the, that education or those skills that they need. It's just literally removing the student from the space and what we did so what to help teachers buy in because that second question is you know what's the buy-in and helping teachers to buy into the break room is it kind of ties into what I was talking about with students when something is new we don't want them to feel like it's something that we're doing to them but with them so educating teachers at the beginning and administrators, but inviting them first to use the space. So teachers weren't required to use the space. And what happened is there were teachers that participated and then the more that they would talk to their colleagues about using this space, the more teachers that would start participating in, in utilizing the space. So we invited teachers at the beginning and it wasn't something that they had to do, but they could choose to, to utilize the space. 
So a couple more questions. It says, this is from Shelly. I participated in debriefs after incidents. This led to improvements in BIP quality and interventions. Break room use, in my experience, has been very successful. Did you pre-teach those SEL skills prior to the use of the break room? Yes, yes. And, and, we'll, we'll, and when you say pre-teach, you mean to those who were facilitating the break room? I, I'm guessing so. Okay. I'm guessing so, so. Yes, so we would. We did. You said pre-teach to students. Oh, no, we did, we did not. The adults knew the procedure and the process, but the students were interacting in that space based on the way the adults were guiding them then, correct? Yes, correct. Okay. So we have one more question, and I think we're almost to our end. It always goes so fast with you guys. How do you convince schools to put calming items in the break room? When I've requested this for my son, school indicates he's aggressive with the items such as a bean bag, weighted blanket, et cetera. So they've removed all the items and the break room is an empty room about the size of a closet. My son refuses to go to the break space. How can I work with a school as a parent to make this better? Thank you, Jamie, for asking that. That is a challenge. I, could, I can understand that challenge. When we implemented the break room, we were invited into the space in the school. So it was a little different approach that we had and we used donations from the community to create the space and to have items in the space for students to use. I think that, and, and Susan, you can speak on this as well, but my perspective of getting schools, administrators, teachers to buy into it is you don't know what you don't know, so educating. So it was important for us to really talk about how this space is useful and that we're very intentional in how we include the beanbag chairs and the cozy couch and the cozy corners and how those have shown in research. It's not just theory, but ourselves as adults um, comparing, you know, how we take our own breaks and how we, what kind of spaces we use and, and when, when trying to calm down or, or needing to take a break. I think that practical comparison as well can help in conversations. And Shelly, uh, I agree. I think you put in there, you know, it's about teaching kids, right? Teaching the adults and teaching the kids so that they know the expectations. So mm -hmm. um, I think, I think that's what you just touched on Whitney so that everybody understood. Yeah, I'd add to that too is, and, and something I think we tend to underutilize, and that is really to ask for a provisional time to try mm -hmm. these additions and collect data over that provisional time period, whether it's two to four weeks. I don't know, you know, any more persuasive way to say, let's, it's, it, so it's not an all or nothing endeavor, or it's not a forever and ever. We're, let's just try this for four weeks and see how this does affect or influence behavior. And again, a lot of times those data speak very powerfully in terms of these not, and Whitney's absolutely right. There's a huge research phase, but what about for this individual child? Is it a good addition? Yeah, so perfect. Exactly. One last quick question, and this is Alicia. Should, and she's, it's to both of you, do you believe that all staff that work with the student, even bus staff, specialized transportation, should be trained on a student's BIP? Everyone that's working with that student should be aware of that, that plan and how, what the plan is for responses to escalating behaviors. I think that's definitely, definitely. Great. It's important. I would say as well, I completely agree with Whitney. And I also oftentimes will will get some inquiries about these are probably more important in unstructured times, like on mm -hmm. the bus or in the lunchroom or whatever. And so all those who will be responsible for the implementation I do need to be aware of it. That's one fun question I have my law students go out and ask teachers who are working with kids with IEPs. Are you aware of these modifications? You know, did you have a, a voice in terms of structuring these? But the, the real important aspect is not just do the teachers know, do other people, as Whitney's saying, around the students who will be required to implement the intervention also know uh, about those. So one of the questions in the manifestation determination 
is the behavior that's, again, involved with the misconduct, direct response to the school district's failure to implement the BIP. So again, this familiarity and awareness, very, very important. Well, thank you so much, both Susan and Whitney. It was just, yes, very informative, very insightful. Whitney, thank you for joining. It made us all think about our thinking, right? Sure, and that's sure. that there's lots of ways to solve the problem. So it was really interesting what you shared. And so, yeah, getting a lot of thank yous from everybody. And I'm sure it's not all students that just want A's, Whitney, I'm just saying that. Um, that being said, I always like to th thank our ASL interpreters. They are fabulous. Jules and Holly, I couldn't do it without them, and they're wonderful. So, again, thanks, everybody. If you want the recorded sessions, sign up for the ASCII um, email listserv, and we will send that out to you. So lots of thank yous. Hopefully, you both are seeing that in the chat. And looking forward to this fall, Whitney and Susan, and collaborating again for Ask Resource around Chapter 103 and different ways we can all collaborate around this work together. We're stronger together for kids. So thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank Have you. a good evening, everyone. Thank you.